Hi and welcome to this theory tutorial on homeostasis from the biology section of the BMAT. So in this theory session we're going to look at the nervous and hormonal systems, we'll have a look at the control of blood glucose, type 1 and type 2 diabetes, osmoregulation, then control of body temperature and the role of the kidneys. So there's a lot of content in this theory tutorial so make sure you cover it all before jumping on to the BMAT style questions. So how common are homeostasis questions in the biology BMAT? So we can see here that we've had 11 questions on homeostasis since 2009, so it is a very common topic. So homeostasis is the maintenance of a constant body environment. So when there's a change in the internal or the external body environment, homeostasis will correct that change through negative feedback. Now homeostasis is controlled by both the nervous and the endocrine or hormonal systems in the body. So here we've got an example of how the nervous system controls homeostasis. So if we have a fall in our body temperature, then our thermoreceptors are going to be activated and then our thermoregulatory centre is also going to be activated and that is going to lead to a response. So a response might be our hairs, our erector pili muscles contracting and so our hairs stand on end. So what that's going to do is lead to a correction and a maintenance of our body temperature. Okay, so it's going to warm us back up. So an example of how the endocrine system maintains homeostasis, if we have our water levels rising in our blood, then our osmoreceptors are going to notice that change. They're located in the hypothalamus in our brain. Then our osmoregulatory center is going to be activated and it'll send a signal to the pituitary gland to release less ADH, antidiuretic hormone, into the bloodstream. Now, what that's going to do is it is going to reduce the water levels in our blood. So it's going to maintain homeostasis in the body. So responses to the stimulation of the nervous system are short term, whereas responses to the stimulation of the hormonal system are longer term. So let's have a look at comparing the two. So the nervous system has got a faster response. The hormonal system has got a slower response. And then in the nervous system, the signals are sent through electrical impulses via neurons, whereas in our hormonal system, the signals are sent via chemical messengers such as hormones in the blood. Hence, it is a slower response. The nervous system targets a specific region. So for example, in the muscles, it causes that specific muscle to contract. Whereas in the hormonal system, the chemical messengers target the body as a whole, and many different organs might have a receptor for that particular hormone that's been released. Our nervous system can be associated with both voluntary and involuntary reactions. Whereas in our hormonal system, all of our reactions are involuntary. So our pancreas controls blood glucose levels using two hormones. We've got insulin and glucagon. So glucagon is a hormone that increases blood sugar levels by converting stored glycogen into glucose. It's important during starvation or exercise. Insulin is a hormone that reduces blood sugar levels by converting excess glucose into glycogen to be stored. It's really important after eating a meal, for example, because we'll get a huge rush of glucose into the blood and we need to reduce that down to normal levels for the purpose of homeostasis and to maintain our constant body environment. So here's a flowchart for an example of what happens after we exercise and after we eat a meal. So we've got glucose at our normal level, but after exercise, we're gonna end up with a reduction in the glucose levels in our blood. That glucose has been used in respiration to allow our muscles to contract and move. So we've lost and had a reduction in the glucose levels. So that fall is gonna be detected in the pancreas and our alpha cells in the pancreas are going to therefore release more glucagon. Now, as we said before, that glucagon is now going to be able to convert the stored glycogen in our liver back into glucose to be able to go into our bloodstream. That is then going to return our glucose levels back to normal. What about after we eat a meal? So when we eat a meal, we get quite a sudden increase in our glucose levels. So again, our pancreas is able to detect that increase in the blood. And so it's going to get the beta cells and the islets of Langerhans in the pancreas to release more insulin. 
And as we said before, that insulin is then going to be able to convert that excess glucose into glycogen to then be stored for later. So that is going to reduce our blood glucose levels now back to normal. So this is an example of homeostasis, maintaining that constant body environment. In diabetes mellitus, the body struggles to reduce the blood glucose levels after, for example, a meal. So the blood glucose levels stay too high in the blood, and that can lead to a condition such as hyperglycemia, and that can be really dangerous if left untreated. There are two types of diabetes. We've got type 1 and type 2. So in type 1, the body can't produce enough insulin because there is damage to the insulin producing cells in the pancreas whereas type 2 is quite different in this particular case the cells have less sensitivity to the insulin in terms of the age of onset type 1 tends to present in childhood not always but mostly so sometimes it's called juvenile onset diabetes whereas type 2 usually presents in older patients so in terms of lifestyle factors, type 1 is not influenced by lifestyle. So the onset does appear to be spontaneous. We're not quite sure what does cause the onset of type 1. Whereas with type 2, it is heavily influenced by lifestyle factors such as obesity and high sugar intake in someone's diet, alcohol and smoking. So both of these conditions, type 1 and type 2 diabetes, are identified by seeing high glucose levels in the blood of someone. So they would do a glucose tolerance test. And in terms of treatment with type 1, the beta cells are actually impaired in their ability to produce insulin. So an individual might use insulin injections to control their blood glucose levels and also other drugs as well. Whereas with type 2, it's a sensitivity to insulin issue. So diet control will really help. So reducing overall sugar intake, but also exercise and some medication as well. So to recap, there are two types of diabetes mellitus, type 1 and type 2. So in type 1, it is caused by a lack of insulin or no insulin being produced by the pancreas, whereas in type 2, it is caused by a lack of sensitivity to the insulin hormone. And we can say the insulin receptors are less responsive. So in this particular test, a person will be given a glucose drink and their blood glucose levels will be monitored over several hours. You can see the hours, well, the minutes from the start of the test over here, continuing through. So in a healthy individual, they will drink this drink and you can see their blood glucose levels will rise, but then homeostasis will kick in, their pancreas will secrete insulin, and so that will take that excess glucose and store it as glycogen. So we can see that then reduces their blood glucose levels. Whereas in an individual with diabetes, they drink the drink, their blood glucose levels increases, but they either have type 1 where there isn't the insulin to convert into glycogen, or they have type 2 where they've got less sensitivity. So in both cases, their body is not able to convert that excess glucose into glycogen. So their blood glucose levels is going to remain high and they're going to have hyperglycemia if left untreated. So water content of the blood is detected by osmoreceptors that are in the hypothalamus in our brain. So what that does is the hypothalamus then controls how much antidiuretic hormone or ADH is released by the pituitary gland in the brain. ADH then targets the kidneys and it tells the kidneys how much water to keep or to lose in the urine. We can lose water in three main ways and one that's often forgotten is the lungs. So we know our equation for respiration, we produce carbon dioxide and water. When we breathe out therefore we release water vapour and we can't control how much water vapour or water is lost. Water and ions are also lost in our sweat. And even when water levels are really low in our body, we will still sweat. So we can't control how much water we lose in this process. So urine production and urinating is our main source of water excretion. Now we can partly control this water loss because urinating is a voluntary action. So here's an example of homeostasis where we're trying to keep the water content of the blood at the same level. So what happens in each example? So here we've got a heavy intake of salt or increased sweating. So either exercising, for example, or eating a salty packet of crisps. What our body will do 
is it will lower the water content of our blood and that will get detected. So the pituitary gland is then going to release more ADH and that will tell our kidneys to keep a higher volume of water to be reabsorbed. Therefore, we're going to urinate less. So a smaller amount of urine and it's going to be more concentrated. And you've probably had this before if you've ever been dehydrated. So there is therefore a higher volume of water now in the blood because we've lost less. That is therefore going to return us back to our normal water content. So what happens if we have a heavy intake of water? So now we've got too much water in our blood. Again, that high water content in the blood is going to be detected by the osmoreceptors in our hypothalamus. Our hypothalamus will tell our pituitary gland to release less antidiuretic hormone or ADH. And then that antidiuretic hormone will flow through our blood and it will reach our kidneys. And it will then tell our kidneys that we need to have a lower volume of water absorbed. That means we get quite a lot of urine produced. So we've got a large volume of dilute urine being produced and the lower volume of water is going to move back into the blood. So that lowers our blood water volume again and we go back to normal. In that case, you would obviously have lots of urine produced and it'll be clearer and less dark in colour. And we're back to normal. So why is it important to keep a constant body temperature? Well, it's really essential that we maintain our body temperature at very, very close to 37 degrees Celsius. That is the optimum body temperature for humans. Now, if we deviate either side of that, even by a very, very small amount. So, for example, if we become too warm, we have a fever and we increase our body temperature by just a few degrees Celsius. This will have a dramatic impact on the enzymes in our body and many of our body's processes rely on enzymes. When enzymes get too hot, they get denatured and they stop working. So it's very, very dangerous. If we get too cold or too cool in our internal body temperature, then our enzymes will work too slowly. So the reactions will happen too slowly. Again, this could be really dramatic for our organ functioning. So again, it's really important homeostasis that we maintain it in a very narrow band of 37 degrees Celsius. So how does the brain control our body temperature. Well, the brain has a thermoregulatory center found in the hypothalamus, and that is able to check the blood temperature. But we've also got receptors found in our skin as well. They can give an indication of to our kind of more external body temperature as well. So what happens if the body temperature rises? Well, our stimulus is an increase in temperature. Then it's going to be detected by our skin receptors and that's going to send a signal to our central nervous system. So our thermoregulatory center in the hypothalamus and there's going to be effectors. So a signal sent to our effectors, which will be sweating. Also, our skin hairs lying flat to trap less heat and also vasodilation, which I'll explain in the next slide. So in vasodilation, nerve signals from our hypothalamus tell our arterioles to dilate. Now this allows the blood, the warm blood, to flow to the surface of the skin, close to the surface, which allows heat to be lost from the blood. Impulses can also be sent to glands on the skin, which cause sweating. Now sweating in itself, so water evaporating from the surface of the skin, is an endothermic process, so it's cooling. Some heat energy is therefore transferred from the skin to the air. Nerve impulses from the hypothalamus also tell the erectile pillow muscles in the skin to lie the hairs flat because that causes less air to be trapped and causes less heat to be retained on the skin. So what happens if our body temperature falls? Well, obviously our stimulus is a fall in body temperature and that is detected by receptors on our skin. That's gonna send a signal to our thermoregulatory center in the hypothalamus and we're going to get an effect from that. It's going to be shivering, contraction of muscles rhythmically, We'll get skin hair standing on end to trap a layer of heat, insulation, and we can also get something called vasoconstriction, which I'll explain in the next slide. In vasoconstriction, nerve impulses from the hypothalamus tell the arterioles to constrict. This reduces the amount of blood that can reach the surface of the skin, so it reduces the heat lost to the surroundings. We also have shivering. So this is where the muscles rhythmically contract and relax. Now what this does is it generates heat energy and some of that heat can be used to warm up the body. 
Then we have our skin hair standing on end. So nerve impulses in the hypothalamus tell our erector pili muscles in our skin to pull our hairs on end. And that traps a layer of air, an insulating layer, to keep us warmer. What are the three roles of the kidneys? So one of the things they do is they control ion levels. So they control what ions are lost in the urine. The second thing they do is they can break down toxic urea. Now this urea is produced by the breakdown of proteins in the liver and it is toxic to our bodies. So the kidneys can filter that out of the blood and help that be excreted in the urine. And finally, they control how much water is lost in the urine. So we talked earlier about the fact that the kidneys respond to antidiuretic hormone, ADH, and they control how much water is reabsorbed back into the body or not. We covered a lot of content in this tutorial. We had a look at nervous and hormonal systems. We looked at the control of blood glucose and then more specifically at type one and type two diabetes. We had a look at osmoregulation in the blood, the control of body temperature, and finally, the role of the kidneys. So feel free to go back through the video and recap any of that content and then move on to the next video where we'll take a look at some BMAT style questions on this topic.